So we're chugging along in our study of the Psalms, as you can see there, and uh, I've had a question this week, in case you were wondering about the randomness of this series, because uh, I said weeks ago, we're not going to go through all 150 of the Psalms, but you've maybe wondered what I'm doing. Basically, this is a week-to-week process. As I am walking through this first of the five uh, books within the book of Psalms, these, this, this collection, these first 41 Psalms, mostly by David, all I'm doing each week is looking for the grand themes of Scripture that kind of rise off the page and, and then trying to bring them here to you guys. So it's not random, but it's kind of random uh, as the Holy Spirit shows me exactly what themes we want to cover. So far, we have studied Psalms 1 through 6 and 12 and 14 and 19 and 32 and 33. So we're making progress, which is exciting. And some of the themes we've covered have been huge. I started uh, just writing them out. Righteousness, wickedness, rebellion, the corruption of mankind, threats from enemies, hiding sin, receiving forgiveness, and more. And so far, we've looked at four different types of of psalms. We've looked at wisdom psalms and laments and penitential psalms and one royal psalm. And today we're adding a fifth type of psalm, a messianic psalm from Psalm 22. And um, in some cases on a Sunday, I'm going to come up and just deal with one psalm. At other times, it'll be multiple psalms. But there are certain psalms in the history of the church that have been so precious that I want to take the time to just cover it all by itself. This is one of them, Psalm 22. And next week, we'll do the same with Psalm 23. So the really cool thing about being here in Psalm 22 is just four months ago, as we were getting to the end of our our study of the Gospel of John, we were talking about the death and resurrection of Christ, looking back at Psalm 22. Today we get to exposit Psalm 22 and now look forward to the Gospel accounts of the death and resurrection of the Lord. As I was working on the sermon this, uh, this week, I, I asked this question in my head. I said, have you ever played this game? Uh, you have a chance to go back in time and select one scene from the New Testament that you get to go back and actually witness? What would it be? And and it's so hard to pick just one scene that you would want to be a part of. I came up with like 10 of them instantly, right? And you probably can as well. But if you are a lover of apologetics or a lover of the study of prophecy, let me suggest a scene that you probably wouldn't think of right off the top of your head. What if you were able to go back in time and walk with those two men who were leaving Jerusalem on the day of the resurrection and heading to the town of Emmaus. You know the story, right? They're, they're, they, Jesus has been crucified. There's disappointment. There's confusion. They're leaving the city. They're heading out to this town. And we're told that they are joined by a man, and they're prevented from recognizing him. Later on, we find out he's the risen Christ, and he joins these two travelers on the road. And as they express their disappointment and all that's happened, Jesus says to them, they don't know it's him yet, but he says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things? Now, here's the key. The next verse says this, and beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, think about that for a second. Just pause and think about that for a second. These two guys got a private lesson about apologetics and prophecy from the Son of God. Does that just like send shivers down your spine? A private lesson from the author of Scripture as he walked them through the Old Testament, showing them all the places where he is spoken of. If you give me a chance to go back in time, I want to sit in that meeting and hear Jesus explain the Scriptures. Here's the point for this morning. How much of that discussion do you think focused on Psalm 22? Considering the the crucifixion had just happened a few days before this, I'm guessing, I can't prove it because it's not in the Bible, but I'm guessing that Jesus lingered in this particular psalm as he was talking to these men. And he showed them exactly how the words of David referred to both the cross, but also the ultimate victory that was won at Golgotha. So let's look at it. Grab your Bibles if you're not there yet. Go to Psalm 22. Everybody there? They didn't hear a bunch of Bibles opening. Oh, you got it on your phone. It's okay. It's good. All right. 
Spurgeon preached at length in Psalm 22, and some of his quotes about this particular poem are epic. So let me just set the tone by giving you one of them. Uh, Spurgeon writes this, For expressions rising from unutterable depths of woe, we may say of this psalm that there is none like it. It is the photograph of our Lord's saddest hours, the record of his dying words, the memorial of his expiring joys. We should read this reverently, putting off our shoes as Moses did at the burning bush. For if there be holy ground anywhere in Scripture, it is in this psalm. I'm not going to ask you to take your shoes off. But I want you to think in, that ter- in those terms. This is holy ground we are in. Now this psalm begins with a very well-known phrase, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which raises the question, what was going on in David's life that made him start this psalm with such a, a, an anguished statement? It must have been very, very troubling. And as we get deeper into the poem, we're going to find that he is indeed describing a very extreme, uh, extreme situation. We just don't know exactly what it was because we're not told. We don't know exactly when this happened. Now, some scholars have speculated that Psalm 22 was written during that time in David's life when he was being pursued by Saul, where Saul was seeking to take his life. And that would explain the sense of danger and deprivation that we're about to read about. But here's the thing that scholars also say. As much adversity as we know David went through during that period, the phraseology that he uses here, the descriptions that he uses in this psalm seem to go far beyond any of the difficulties we we read in his life in the Bible. It just goes beyond that. And the only explanation is that he was inspired by the Spirit of God to write beyond his own situation. And that's an important thing to understand, to write beyond his own situation. That, that he was writing, looking forward to the future son of David, to the one we call Jesus of Nazareth. So this is messianic, this is prophetic, again, written about a thousand years be the, before the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. Some scholars say there's at least 33 prophecies of Jesus in these 31 verses. And the most stunning of all is the very precise description of crucifixion. Now, why is that stunning? Because in 1000 BC, there was no knowledge of crucifixion. It just had not been developed anywhere in the ancient world. You can go through all the ancient historical sources, read and read, and you will find that the first actual description of crucifixion comes 500 years after the life of David. The Persians were the first ones to use it that we know of in the historical record. Then the the Greeks learned it from the Persians, and then, of course, the Romans took it from the Greeks, and they perfected crucifixion as a tool of torture, but also a tool of deterring crime, and they were very good at it. So amazing, right, that that David is going to write these things that you look at and you go, that is crucifixion, but it's not even a thing yet. Now, the question then is asked, was David aware of what he was writing? And we don't know for sure. We can't, we can't know because obviously we weren't there. But we can say that two things can be true at the same time. One, that to some extent, David was writing about his own situation, whatever he was going through. But two, he was also being carried along by the Holy Spirit to use certain language that eventually would coincide with the details that we read about in the crucifixion of the Messiah. Now, in terms of the structure of the psalm, there's a very clean break between verses 21 and 22. So if you're one of those people that likes to mark up their Bible, and I I recommend it, just draw a line between verses 21 and 22. Those first 21 verses cover the agony of the forsakenness that David was feeling at this time. And then the last 10 verses point forward to the ultimate triumph of Yahweh and his kingdom. So very different tone and tenor in this particular psalm, and we'll break that down more as we go along. So what I want to do this morning as we exposit this is actually go about halfway down so that we set the context of what David was going through. So, And this will get us into the most prophetic section as well. So drop down to verse 12, and we'll look at verses 12 to 18. Now, um, I'm going to put a, a series of pictures on the screen. I don't expect you to be able to read that if this is not an eye test. Um, <laughs> But as we jump through the psalm and we look at certain sections, I want you to sort of see the way it's laid out. And we're going to jump down here to the crucifixion details 
that you see there on, highlighted in yellow. Look at verse 12. Here's what David writes. He says, many bulls have surrounded me. That sounds terrifying. Have you ever been around a, an actual bull, like a, the size of a bull? Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening or mauling and a roaring lion. So it's so, it's so, the conflict that David is experiencing is so bad that he's describing his enemies as ferocious animals. Now we, we understand that lions are, are dangerous, right? In fact, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Up until the late 1800s, Asiatic lions roamed all over the Middle East until they were hunted out of existence. So sometimes we, we, think, we think lions, we think where? Africa, right? But whenever you see lion in Scripture, know that they used to be very common in the Middle East as well. And so David references them there. The weird one are the bulls. And the bulls here are, come from a place called Bashan. And, and you know when I saw that, I was like, ooh, I haven't done a map in so long. It's, it's killing me. So, so and, and, and it makes a difference. So Bashan is, see that red circle, is an area to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee, just beyond the Golan Heights. And this area in Israel, uh, it's known as the Hula Valley, is one of the most fertile parts of this entire region. Okay? It is filled with agriculture and farmland, incredibly lush. In fact, as you see there, the word Bashan in Hebrew means fruitful. So the bulls that came from this region were known to be well-fed and extremely big and strong and, yes, vicious if you ended up in their path. And so this is how David feels in the midst of this trouble, this, this feeling of being forsaken by God. He is encircled by these ferocious animals and the walls are closing in on him. Now you can imagine, thinking prophetically, that Jesus felt the same thing, hanging on the cross, looking down and seeing his enemies encircling him. Vicious enemies, right? And, and we know this, that he is the Son of God, hanging on the cross. He could have called in 10,000 legions of angels to free himself, but because of his own decision, his own will, he suffered in silence to atone for your sin and for mine. Now take your mind back in the recent study in the Gospel of John. Recall how the religious establishment of Israel had conspired to put Jesus to death. Remember how badly the chief priests and the scribes despised Jesus. The only way to explain the, the vitriol that they showed towards Jesus in these last weeks of his life is that it was a satanic hatred. They were driven by the enemy, cold and merciless and relentless. They were utterly committed to making Jesus pay for the crime of challenging their power. That was what was going on. They were utterly committed to using the power of the Roman state to execute Jesus in the most vicious way possible. And in light of that, it's worth considering that when David speaks of a roaring lion here, there may be a connection with what the Apostle Peter writes in his first epistle, where he describes who is a roaring lion? The devil. He says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Same phraseology thousands of years later. Satan obviously sought to devour the Son of God on that Friday in Jerusalem, and he used his servants, both the religious establishment of Israel and the Roman state, to put him to death. But he clearly didn't realize how much that was going to backfire, right? So let's keep going. Verse 14, now we've seen lions and bulls. Verse 14, this is now the more physical aspect of this oppression. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, which is like baked clay. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws, or it sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, as you read that, how can anybody actually deny that that is a description of what Jesus went through on the cross? It seems impossible to deny that language, right? And yet, trust me, there are many who do deny it for their own personal and religious reasons. Most of the people who want to try to talk you out of Psalm 22 being in any way connected with Christ 
will say that that is a description of David going through a very serious illness. That is their explanation. And I'm just this, this is a book, this is a great resource if you've never seen it. This is an actual Jewish study Bible. So if you ever wanted to know, well, how do, how do faithful Jews explain away some of the prophecies in the Old Testament? This is a great resource. This is a legitimate Tanakh with a rabbinical commentary attached to it. So let me read. I went to this, obviously, first thing this week and said, what did they say about this particular section in Psalm 22? Here's what it says. Quote, this is a graphic description of mortal illness. The psalmist feels his body stop working and disintegrate. He sees himself die, his body so dried up that it turns to dust. So that's the Jewish explanation for this. But of course, I would counter with two things. First of all, there is no description anywhere that I can find in the Old Testament where it talks about David being so mortally ill that he almost dies. It's just not there. Now, you still may explain that away and say, well, the Bible doesn't explain every possible thing. But the language in this section seems to go way beyond just a sickness. Bones out of joint, hands and feet pierced, being surrounded by enemies seeking to kill you, gambling for your clothes. On its face, and just using common sense, it seems like there's much more going on here than just an illness. And what a brutal and agonizing list of symptoms we have here. What does it mean to be poured out like water? To be completely empty with no strength left? right? Just utter weakness as you feel life slipping away. Bones out of joint. Now we can certainly, as you picture a crucifixion, you can certainly understand this, right? This, this awkward and strained position that Jesus is in. His shoulders would have both dislocated as he's trying to hold his weight up. His bones are out of joint. You can feel it, right? His heart turned to wax and melted. That's, that's, that's got to be both emotional and physical. Remember, as your body's in shock, your heart would be pumping at an excess rate to try to get blood out to the extremities. His strength dried up like baked clay. His tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. Imagine how dehydrated you would be on that cross, your system in shock, your shoulders out of their sockets, and having to lift and gasp for every single breath just to stay alive. By the way, John specifically confirms this statement in Jesus' final moment. John 19, 28. It says, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, said what? I am thirsty. A direct fulfillment of Psalm 22. Then surrounded by dogs and evildoers. Now, I got bad news for you dog lovers. In the ancient Near East, dogs were not beloved pets. Don't think golden retrievers here, right? Wagging their tail and wiggling at you. No. In that day, dogs roamed the land in packs. They were considered filthy, dirty animals, and yes, dangerous when they were together. So again, this is another reference to Jesus' enemies who encircled the cross in order to watch him die. Imagine. Haters and scoffers. How dark does your heart have to be to stand and watch a man suffer this way and die to protect your power and to gloat over that, to be pleased by that, to watch him slowly die? Dogs, evildoers. Then pierce his hand and feet. What else can that be but crucifixion? Later prophets, by the way, confirm what David says here. We know Isaiah writes, for example, of the coming Messiah. He was pierced for our transgressions, same language. Zechariah writes, Yahweh will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me, the one they have pierced. Same language. Can count all my bones despite the suffering on the cross, Jesus suffered no broken bones. He's able to count them all. Once again, John says that's a direct fulfillment of prophecy, right? He, John writes, these things came to pass to fulfill the scriptures. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And then last, they divide my garments and cast lots for my clothing. Again, what could that mean related to a sickness? Once again, we see a very specific prophecy about exactly what the soldiers did at the foot of the cross and again, think about how heartless that is. How dark does your heart have to be 
to say, this man above me is dying slowly in the most torturous way. He's got this one possession. Let's gamble for it and laugh as he dies. And again, don't miss it. David writes all of these things before crucifixion was even a thing. This can only be the work of a supernatural move of God's Spirit to write these things down. So that is the context. In some sense, David is going through something awful, but obviously this points forward to Jesus. Now let's go back up to the top and let's look at this familiar beginning to the psalm. Verse 1. I call this section, by the way, the great struggle. This section is the, the great struggle. What we're about to read, every person in this room can identify with. It is a physical and spiritual back and forth wrestling of a man that is under great stress. Great stress, great temptation. He's being attacked. He's feeling weak. He's feeling alone. And yet what you see in this section, he is still striving to trust. Every one of us can identify with this. Let's look at these two cycles. You'll see it right here. You see in this section uh, two cycles of complaint and then confidence. Complaint and then confidence. He's battling to believe. He's battling to trust the Lord. So where are you, God, is going to yield to but I know you will deliver me. And I'm under attack is going to be, but you are my God. This is the struggle. Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken or abandoned me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. And you, you get a sense in this, almost a tone of surprise in David's voice. Why? Why, Lord? I don't understand why would the Lord not be answering me. And it's an awful feeling, isn't it? When you are in a desperate place and you are struggling and you feel like your prayers are not being heard, and yet we all know, even when that's happening, you know, you got to get up and move on in life, right? So you move on through your day, but you don't sense that peace and that, that joy that you want. And the longer you wait, the more you feel silenced, the more overwhelming it becomes. We're no different than David 3,000 years ago wrestling with this thing. This is where David was. He had found himself in this impossible circumstance, enemies closing in, his life in the balance, and he is wondering, Lord, if I've ever need you before, I need you now. Why have you immediately not come to my rescue? Why are you so far away from helping me, Lord? And remember, David was very familiar with what it felt like to have the strong presence of the Lord in his life. He's familiar with how the Lord would come and deliver him at times. Think of Goliath. Think about the moment that he experienced when he was battling Goliath, but not this time. Now he feels unheard, and he has no explanation. That is an awful feeling. Now, Jesus then deliberately chose to use these words exactly to express his agony on the cross. So we can be fairly certain that as Jesus was hanging there for hours, he was meditating upon the scriptures, upon the Old Testament, and yes, he would have clearly known that he was dying in that particular way to fulfill Psalm 22. No question about that. But we have to be careful not to misinterpret why Jesus quoted this verse on the cross. I am convicted of this truth. I shared it on Good Friday this year as we talked about it. It, it's, it, dis it disagrees with much of what you've read about this particular statement. But let me share what I think about why Jesus quotes Psalm 22, 1 from the cross. First of all, as a fully human man, he felt every bit of the pain. He felt every bit of the isolation of being on that cross, bearing the wrath of God all by himself. There is no question about that. It would have been awful beyond anything we can imagine. But does that mean that God the Father actually abandoned his son on the cross? Does it mean that God turned his back on God the Son on the cross? No. Because sound theology will not allow for that. Because there can never be a separation in the union between God the Father and God the Son. I don't care how much, and I've read much of the literature on this, well, we just have to appeal to mystery on this. No. But that, that is a convenient excuse. There can be no separation in the union between father and son. If the father had truly abandoned his son on the cross, then the Godhead would have ceased to be eternally one. Can't happen. 
And here's the other thing. Jesus wasn't merely a man like David. He wasn't driven by his emotions and doubts about God's presence as David was. Jesus knew better. He knew exactly what was going on. Absolutely, he is suffering under the weight of sin. But no, he wouldn't have not felt forsaken by the Father. He knew better. He knew that his Father and he were indivisibly one. And to to act like Jesus just didn't know that on the cross and so he was feeling forsaken, no. No, he's God the Son. So if he wasn't feeling forsaken, why quote this particular verse? Well, if you look in the account in Matthew 27, it very clearly says Jesus said in a loud voice the exact phrase from Psalm 22.1. By the way, he didn't say, Father, why have you forsaken me? That was his normal way of addressing God. He specifically and exactly cited David's words, my God, my God. Why? So that all those watching on that day, and especially his enemies, standing at the foot of the cross, would hear him declare one last time his connection with David and his identity as Messiah. So even in his last moments, up to his last breath, Jesus was teaching those around him at the cross. And for everybody there who had ears to hear, he was making it very clear who he was. I am the son of David and and Israel's Messiah. And then it was finished. That, I think, is what is really going on here. Okay, I got really quiet here. You guys all okay with that? Okay, all right, good. Okay, come see me afterwards if you want to object to that. Because, look, there's a lot of literature out there that says, yeah, there's a mystery about how Jesus was forsaken. No. No. So the rawness of David's concern comes out in verses 1 through 2. But then look at verse 3. He sort of autocorrects. And we do this as well. We start to whine and complain about life, and they're like, oh, pff, wait, hold on a second. I need to trust God. Well, he does that here. Verse 3. So complain, complain. Yet you are holy. O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Guys, this is a great model for us, for the struggling believer. When you are in pain and you are doubting, when you're feeling forsaken, go to the word. Go to the Word. Go back to what you know about God. Back to what He has told you about Himself. Read of His faithfulness in the past. Read of His promises. Recall times in your life when He has been your refuge. See, that's what David is doing. Yeah, he's feeling all this pain, but then he autocorrects and says, yep, hold on a second. I know some things about God. Go back to the Word, right? And David should have gone to the Torah, Deuteronomy 31, it says very clearly, at a time when Moses was speaking to Joshua, it says, Moses says, Yahweh is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. By the way, that gets picked up in Hebrews 13, where it says, He himself has said, I will never desert you. Listen, Christian, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. When you're feeling all these things that David was feeling, come back to that promise. And David here is able to turn it around by recalling, first of all, God's holiness, then speaking that he's enthroned in heaven, and then remembering, oh, God has been faithful to the patriarchs in the past. He will be faithful to me. In him I trust. But then he gets wobbly again in verse 6. I love this, right? And again, is this not just like us? One moment we're walking by faith, we're feeling so strong. Hey, brother, hey, sister, I'm doing so well. The next day, ah! <laughs> right? We get wobbly. We go, we go back to despair. Look, it's part of the human condition. So he goes, verse 6, ah, but I'm a worm and not a man. Ah, I mean, this is David, right? I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Ah, hear that? The fear of man. What drives him to get wobbly is all these people are despising me. Hmm. Verse 7, all who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They do the hmm face. You know that face, right? Paige is loving every minute of this, by the way. It's 
great. You know, you know you've seen that face, right? Mm, oh. They separate with the lip. They wag their heads, saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. So the intensity of this conflict that David's going through, plus this perceived silence, has not only made him feel isolated now, but insignificant. I am a worm. It's driven by the fear of man. And what had brought about this cycle of doubt? It's the sneering. It's the mocking. It's all these gestures of contempt and ridicule that he describes here. He's already feeling forsaken. Now these people are taking shots at his walk with God in order to drain him of confidence in Yahweh. Oh, he claims to delight in Yahweh, so let Yahweh come and save him. That's what's ba- It's this sarcastic thing, right? We'll see if God really cares about him. That's what the people are saying. Oh, you delight in God? Well, all right. Let's see if God comes and helps you. And if he doesn't, what should we assume? It's almost Job-like, isn't it? Remember Job's friends? And this is exactly the same line of attack, by the way, that was launched at Jesus. Do you remember it? The exact same line. The scribes and the chief priests and the Pharisees at the cross. In fact, Matthew records it. Those passing by were healing abuse at him. Same phrase. Wagging their heads and saying, Oh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Can you, can you sense the sarcasm, the mocking? If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. You know, pop those nails out if you're really the son of God. He saved others. He can't save himself. They're mocking him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. That's exactly from Psalm 22. If he delights in him, for he said, I'm the son of God. It's exactly what David described in Psalm 22. In this remarkable display of blindness and tragic irony, these people taunt the Lord of glory, just as David prophesied that they would. So David's wobbling because of these attacks, right? But then in verse 9, he writes the ship again. He comes back to his confidence. Verse 9, Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Guys, another great model for the struggling believer. In moments of doubt and feeling forsaken, listen, remember your story. Remember the testimony of God in your life when you are wrestling. Recall how God first came to you. Recall how God drew you to himself. Recall how he brought your heart to life and suddenly you wanted to know this God and love this God and worship this God. And know that that is nothing you did in and of yourself. That was a work of God. He called you then, so why would he forsake you now? That's what David is doing here. Lord, you've always been with me, David says. So why am I doubting you now? Right? Complaint confidence, complete confidence. So we read of David's trouble. Now, we see him battling through this. Next, we see his plea for help. And it's this, it actually starts in verse 11, but it drops down even more in verses 19 to 21. So what is David now asking of God? Verse 11, be not far from me, he says, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Then drop down to verse 19. He says it again, but you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, Hasten or come quickly to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of these dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth. Listen, David seems to affirm that if he just knows that God is with him, he can endure anything. If I can just have the presence of God with me. And you see, look at the verbs. Help, come, deliver, save. The good thing you can say about David here is he knows that his only hope is in the Lord, that he cannot pull himself out of this himself. That's a lesson we need to learn, right? His hope is in the rescue of the Lord. And then that brings us to the great transition in this psalm, right? Look at the last phrase in verse 21. It says, you answer me. That is the turning point of the psalm. And from verse 22 now to the end, there's this amazing shift in the whole feeling of the poem. So David gets an answer from God, according to verse 21, no longer feeling forsaken, and it comes to David in this flood of relief. It's like 
going through a hurricane, right? And then suddenly you open the curtains one day and now the sun is shining through. It's a flood of relief in David's life. God has not left me. He has not forsaken me. And now everything looks different. Now the complaints and doubts were certainly there. This is, this is what we, this, so step back now. Da, and and I, I'm wondering if David did this. Like, have you ever done this? You're like, the Lord comes to you and blesses you and you see him working and you're like, what was wrong with me over the last couple of days? <laughs> why, why was I complaining so much? Why didn't I trust? It, it's, it's this regret that you have like, oh my goodness, I need to do better than this. But the complaints were there. And they were raw complaints. And I I think it's important to say that God is not somehow upset or disappointed in human beings, right? When we struggle and when we ask hard questions and when we say to God, I don't understand. I think that's important, right? But it's important to understand this at the same time. God is never far off from the believer. He is never far off. We might perceive that he is, but he's never far off. He's always with us because his steadfast love does not fluctuate like our emotions do. And that's important to know. What appears to us as silence and forsakenness at times is actually the Lord giving us an opportunity to grow. He's giving us a chance to walk by faith and not by sight. He is stretching us and maturing us in our faith as any good father would do. You dads, you cannot just... You cannot just meet every need that your son or daughter has. That will not be good for him or her. There are times when you need to help that child stretch and grow. And we can't expect God to grant us this perpetual flood of consolation all day, every day. Oh, I'm just, Lord's up there going, I'm just going to make you feel good all the time and make you feel really strong. That is how we end up with an immature faith. Because now everything that we believe, everything that we trust is dependent upon how we feel about it. Rather than the objective truth of what God has said about his love and care for you, right? We end up leaning into our feelings too much. And then when suddenly we don't feel like we want to feel, we're starting to question God's faithfulness. And so God doesn't give us consolation all day, every day. Sometimes he doesn't. And as we mature in our faith, we learn to endure times of difficulty, even if we're struggling to, quote, feel the presence of God. As we grow, we're not rattled by that anymore because we're maturing, we're growing in the faith. It's because we've learned to lean into the word of God. We've learned to trust the actual promises he gives us. And we've learned that when we're struggling, we can walk side by side with other members of our church family and be built up and edified and sustained through that. That is the maturing process of the Christian. Now, let's look at these last two sections, and and we're going to have to go quick on this because I'm I'm out of time. From verses 22 to 31, by the way, this is what Grant read in our call to worship this morning. I'll highlight a a couple of things. Verse 22 is an absolute key. We're going to hone in on that. This is this, this final section. There we go. So I broke it up, verses 1 to 21 over here, verses 22 to 31. So this is the... That's the agony on that side. This is the victory on the other side. And verse 22 is an absolute key. Look what it says. I will tell of or proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. So now understand, David's writing this. He has now been delivered. If not from the crisis itself, he's at least been delivered from this this lie that somehow God has forsaken him. And what does he promise to do? To respond to that with glory and praise to the Lord. And to not just do it privately, but to go into the congregation and to praise it publicly. Why do we do that? Because we need to hear testimonies of God's goodness. You can hold on to it yourself, and that's great, but you know what's really great is when the church gathers and we do testimonies and say, let me tell you what God is doing. And so David goes to the midst of the congregation and he speaks of the Lord's goodness and the Lord's faithfulness, how he came to him as his refuge. It's encouraging and edifying for all of us. What's really cool about verse 22 is that the author of Hebrews picks up that same verse and applies it to Jesus, again, putting him at the center of this prophecy. And by the way, Jesus is not just the center of this prophecy on the agony side, but also on the victory side. You have to know that. Here's what Hebrews 2 says. For it was fitting for him, 
for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings, the cross. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, here's the quote from Psalm 22, I will, Jesus, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praises. So, so get the picture here. Jesus is standing in the midst of the congregation of the redeemed and through all of that suffering, right? The, the, the bones out of joint, the heart melting, the, the hands pierced and the feet pierced, mocked by his enemies, through all that, says the author of Hebrews, Jesus was validated as our sufficient sacrifice, bringing many sons and daughters like us to glory with him. So Jesus is the center of Psalm 22, both in the agony and in the victory, because he's not dead. He's alive. He's with us even in the congregation this morning. And we forget that sometimes. He will stand in the midst of the congregation, and he's not ashamed to look in this room and say, brothers and sisters, that is an amazing thing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Jesus is not ashamed of you. In fact, he delights in calling you brothers and sisters. It's amazing. Spurgeon says this. One last Spurgeon. When we sing on earth, is not Jesus Christ in the midst of the congregation, gathering up all the notes which come from sincere lips to put them into the golden censer and to make them rise as precious incense before the throne of the infinite majesty. You want a big vision of worship? Look at that quote. It's beautiful. And that's what we get from Psalm 22 and from the book of Hebrews. Okay, last quick note in this last section. At the very end of Psalm 22, everything gets really big and really eschatological and filled with amazing hope. Look at verse 27. So this is this final section here. The victorious kingdom. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth. Now, remember where we started? I'm complaining about all my circumstances. Look, how, look where David ends up. Look how big this is. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. Man, did God encourage David's heart or what? This is big, right? And it reminds you, it should click in your brain back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 where it says, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. There is coming that time. And it points us towards this kingdom which is described all through the Old Testament by the prophets in particular. A golden age where Isaiah says, Zion will be lifted up as chief of the mountains and all the nations of the earth will will stream to Jerusalem for wisdom to be taught the ways of the Lord. Can you picture that? Every nation on earth streaming to Jerusalem to know the Lord, to hear of his ways. That's what David's talking about here. He's prophesying the very end. And of course, we open up our New Testaments and we see, yeah, this kingdom is called the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, where, where Jesus, that one hanging on the cross with all of those symptoms, he will rule over the nations of the earth. Every one of them. And at his, knee, at his name, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you talk about a psalm that goes from micro to macro, right? From struggle to absolute glory. This is an amazing psalm. Last two verses, 30 and 31. Posterity will serve him it will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people not yet born, that he has performed it or he has done it. Guys, this language comes very close to Jesus' great declaration on the cross. It is finished. It is finished. David says he has done it. Wow. What has he done? Well, everything necessary to demonstrate his sovereign, gracious, victorious rule over all. He has finished the work of redemption. So catch the bookends. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He has done it. It is finished. Right? David prophesies the pattern of Jesus' greatest declarations while hanging on the cross a thousand years before it happens. Amazing. So, just a couple quick thoughts just to take home with you before we pray together. Guys, first of all, be careful and cautious as you try to assess the level of God's presence in your life because your feelings are not trustworthy. Be careful. Come back to his word. Come back to his promises. Remember what he has said. I will never leave you or forsake you. Believe it. And if you still find yourself, like David, vacillating back and forth between fear and trust, well, reach out to somebody in the body and say, I need some help here. This is a huge part of the purpose of the small, tight band of believers we have here at Oak Hill that we can be there. You are never alone in this church family. We will walk through these difficult things together. This is the journey of a Christian as a pilgrim in this life. Secondly, always remember that hard times will come your way. There is going to be a time, if it hasn't happened yet, where you, where you will be surrounded by dogs and lions and bulls. <laughs> Ferocious animals. So what are you going to do when that happens? Put a bookmark in Psalm 22. Come back to it and say, okay, I see what's happening. I'm now going to go back and say, well, what did David learn? What did David learn through this? We look at how the saints struggled in the Bible. We look at how the saints overcame in the Bible. And we learn from it. Put a bookmark in Psalm 22. Come back and say, oh, okay, I get it. I saw what David went through. I saw how the Lord brought him out of it. And apply that to your life. And then last thing, this, this is just be amazed at that Bible sitting in your hands right now. Be amazed at it. Does it not encourage you to see how precise that prophecy is? It's amazing. Let it bolster your faith. If God's word can accurately describe crucifixion 500 years before it ever came into being and then predict all these details of Jesus' death, even down to the words that his enemies would say and to the fact that the Roman soldiers gambled for his clothes. If it can do all of that, then it is pretty solid evidence that that book in your hands is a unique, one-of-a-kind, divinely inspired book that is filled with absolute truth. So put it at the center of your life. Knowing that, dig yourself deeply. Put your roots down deep. And then go do what it says. <laughs> because it's truth. And as the psalmist says, if you will, you will prosper and you will be fruitful. Believe it. Amen? Let's bow our heads. As we've been doing each and every Sunday, we're going to just pray some of the principles in this psalm. But as, as we do this, I know we have a tendency to check out when we close in prayer. I'm going to pray personally. Make it personal to you. Let's pray together. Lord, I acknowledge this morning that you are indeed holy, that you are indeed enthroned in heaven at the right hand of majesty. Lord, I acknowledge that you are my God. Thank you for calling me out of my rebellion and drawing me to yourself for bringing me to life and justifying me through the blood of your sacrifice. I praise you, Lord, that you consistently deliver your chosen ones from trouble. And so be near me, Lord, in my times of trial. I acknowledge that you alone are my help. Lord, seal the truth in my heart that you will never leave me. And you will never forsake me. But I thank, e thank you even for the times where I perceive silence, that you are stretching my faith, that you are growing me and maturing me and helping me to walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus, thank you for enduring the cross for me and for my brothers and sisters here this morning. We are so glad that the work of redemption is finished. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even now as we sing, and respond to your word. May you be glorified in this place.